Welcome to Mac and Blue, where we introduce you to who is building Arizona, bringing you the people and businesses that shape the landscape around us. From economic development and developers, underwriters and lenders, architects and engineers, to the very builders and suppliers that bring it all together. For all things Mac and Blue, head to www.macandblue.com and don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. Now let's join our host, JJ Levensky. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Mac and Blue. I'm JJ Levinsky, your host, uh, co-founder and president of Blue Wave General Contracting. I have a really exciting and fun guest today, Heather Lennon. A little bit something out of the norm. Yes, she's in construction, but she's got some really cool other things she does. Uh, so with that, welcome, Heather. Thank you. Happy to be um, here. Okay, I am, I'm not fluent in foreign language, but just so you know, she is a cigar aficionado, which I can greatly appreciate with a nice whiskey, and owner of, is it Raconteuse? Raconteuse. Raconteuse Cigars, which means yes. storyteller, right? Yes, it's the female derivation of the male word raconteur, which is oh, a yeah. story, good storyteller. And uh, for us, uh, cigars is is about communing with our people. Yes. So it's about sharing stories, and I just assume that if it's going to be a woman's cigar business, she better be a raconteur. <laughs> so I love it. Therein lies the rub. Uh, also, she's mm-hmm. owner and CEO of Warehouse, I'm going to say 215, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and for those of you that don't know Heather, um, she was just featured in Phoenix Business Journal, and that's how I kind of spied on her and reached out to her because uh, I, I hopefully in the in the course of the podcast today we get to hear about some of the cool things she's doing with the the reuse of historic buildings in in, in downtown. So, um, welcome. Thank you. Uh, for the audience's sake, though, just you know, kind of ice breaking and everything else, people always want to know well. Who's Heather? What's her background? Like all those kind of things. So mm. I'm not looking for your resume, but can you give <laughs> us kind of a cool uh, just background of like where'd you grow up and sure. how'd you get to Arizona and and maybe just, you know, how we're kind of even, why are we here talking today? Like how did we get even to this point? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, I was born in New York. I moved out to Las Vegas when I was very young. I grew up in Vegas and then went back to New York for my last three years of high school. Oh. So I'm kind of bi-coastal. Um, I like that. But, bicoastal. Uh, exactly. So I'm... Uh, like me, I'm bipolar, right? <laughs> <laughs> there's that, yes. But then I, I went to college and grad school in Tucson at the U of A and uh, just stayed and uh, fell in love with Phoenix. Met I met my husband in college. So nice. uh, we've been in Phoenicians ever since. Phoenicians, I love it. So... And by the way, she does have on, on the background here. She's she's an '80s music person, so I already love her. And play her. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favorite band? Oh gosh, I don't. I mean, of all time, probably Prince. Oh, if I had to say, there you go. I mean, he's the master of all things. And we musical. just had, unfortunately, his anniversary yeah. of his passing last week. Yeah, yeah. So. Which by the time when this hits the air, the timing will be off, but we can still talk about it. Absolutely, raise a glass to him. Um, okay, so I sorry I interrupted you. Um, back and forth to grad school and stuff. Mm-hmm. When and how did you get into construction then? Well, um, it, I kind of went a sideways route. Okay. Um, my my whole family is very entrepreneurial. It's kind of our family legacy. Um, it's something that for many many generations, it's what we have done. Um, so I was always the, the looking, New Yorker in you. Right? Yes, yes, the Jewish New Yorker in me. <laughs> we absolutely. I, my family it thrives on it, and uh, so it was just a matter of figuring out what niche I wanted to be in. Um, so my master's degree focused on uh, consumer behavior and the design of retail stores. So I started a design firm, and then it just evolved. People asked me to do more and more, so I uh, got my residential and commercial general contractor's license here in Phoenix. I'm the QP if people... Uh, know what that means. That's a qualifying party. So I'm the one with the knowledge base. I was the one who took the actual tests and then hire someone. Um, and yeah, so I started out with a design firm, became a general contractor, um, and that evolved um, into being a developer on my own right. Oh. So now I'm able to buy my own buildings and uh, find ways to adaptively reuse them, find ways to generate income, jobs, things like that. So Go, go back to the... Cons- uh, not that I... You know, I'm not a big degree guy, you mm-hmm. know, by any stretch of the imagination. But I, I do think it's interesting that y- your emphasis on consumer behavior and, and retail. Mm-hmm. 
after that, Heather, did were you working for like big firms on a no, consulting basis not with at your all. design? No. Okay. It was so more I, bit boutique and niche. Absolutely, okay. always. Okay. Okay. So I went fresh out of grad school and worked for a woman who ran a very successful small business. And then a few years after that, just decided to go out on my own. I started mm-hmm. a design firm. And uh, I remember telling myself I wanted to give myself a year to replace my salary. <laughs> and uh, I replaced it in three months. Wow. And so I've never looked back, and that was over 25 years ago. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, okay, so then as you've, as you've matured and, and gone through the construction space, mm-hmm. what, what led you to kind of this adaptive reuse? Or, or I'd love to hear the story of, like, was it all, was it all empathy? Was it a little bit of, of both your head and your heart combining? Uh, I think everyone always wants to know that. Sure. I think that a lot of it is just... Having, if you've traveled the world at all, you realize what a young country we are, Agreed. and how few buildings we have that speak to that history. Um, anytime I travel, I'm really, really interested in the architecture, old architecture, um, live music, and good cigars. So any place I go, I want to find those things to do. And I think that there's, you know, there's so few historic buildings that are left in the downtown area and in Phoenix as a whole. And even that, they're you know, a hundred and something years old instead of a thousand years old where you go elsewhere. Yeah. So I just find it um, very rewarding. I'm very well versed in historic. It's something I've done for a really long time. So the adaptive reuse comes easily to me. Uh, nothing kind of scares me anymore because I've been there, done that. Um, so I just, um, after building retail stores and spaces for other people for 25 years, I definitely have a very honed skill at, as to how to monetize square footage. Um, and, That's key. Uh, it really is, because yeah. in order to save a building, you have yeah. to be able to monetize it. It's not just a, a stoic piece that that I want it to be able to be of service to the community. And in doing so, you have to go through a lot of different iterations as to how might this best work. Um, is it bringing in you know, a tenant? Is it um, turning it into something else completely? Is it yeah. um, partnering with someone? And in, in, in the case of Warehouse 215, um, I decided that it was, um, after talking to a lot of people and trying on different ideas, I decided it was probably the most advantageous to revamp the not only the building, but the existing um, sm- uh, fledgling, I will call it, <laughs> event business that had been running. So they were doing very small-scale DIY bride type of things oh, yeah. and kind of a smattering of the fabulous but uh, that building had so much more opportunity than was being utilized. So we, uh, let's see, I took on a partner um, who's my uncle, um, and he's uh, based out of New York. He's been a developer for 50 years, and he's fabulous. And uh, I started a search. I found a realtor. I found a team of all the people I needed, from attorneys to title people to, you know, people to do Alta surveys and do, you know, environmental testing and um, but I'm comfortable in that world because I've been in construction for so long. Right. So uh, we bought two buildings and acreage around it. And we, let's see, we moved in in June, in the middle oh, of just July. Oh, last year? Yes. Okay. So in the middle of July, uh, I got a PBI permit. And uh, September 22nd, we launched. So I had two months. And the building is 28,000 square feet. <laughs> so, yes, it was a, it was a, an all out kind of favor asking endeavor to uh, to have my subs come and join me uh, on this uh, amazing journey. But they also understand and have great respect for old buildings. Right. So the people that I work with truly have a love for what they do. Now, Heather, when you took this on, the, the I had a million things going through my mind. Mm. First of all, I should go back. Without patronizing you, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think we should create a new major called you know, combine architecture and construction all and engineering all in one. And then if you can't get past the cultural um, food and beverage part, you should just flunk out. <laughs> <laughs> and adding the cigars just makes it. I, if that would have been around, if, you had, if I'd have known you earlier in life, I think it would have gone down a different path. Well, I, I, anyone that says they don't have any vices, I don't trust. Oh. So this is definitely my chosen vice. I love it. And uh, yeah, it's a great, cigar people are great. It's a wonderful community. Right. It's very inclusive. Um, and it uh, kind of attracts people from all walks of life, which I really enjoy. I've done a lot of traveling on my own, and I'm perfectly adept to go into 
any place I am and find a lounge and go and sit and work and smoke and talk. And um, I've never had a situation where I didn't feel welcome. The art of conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in society, you see that loss now. And, sure. Uh, you know, as I go with friends, I'm, I'm I'm not in your level, but I still enjoy going with friends to a cigar bar. Mm -hmm. And I notice immediately the conversations. Yeah, of course. And, and they're just—I don't know—they're just—it's cool. It's—it's—it's—it's it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not fake. It's very. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, just, it's good to see people connecting again. So that was one. Um, the other one was when you were talking about it. Um, I try to put myself into a retailer. Mm. Um, you know, as me as a general contractor, I experience a lot of not the same clients as you, but we get a lot of. Uh, and I, I don't want to sound condescending with this, but you know, maybe boutique one-off type stuff. They're not sophisticated. They're not these big retail chains. They don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. Right, Heather? Yeah. So with your background, I could see, especially in the light of what that, what Warehouse 215 represents, both from a finished product, mm -hmm. but more almost on, like on a feeling is, you know, let's say I've got some sort of niche business, call it retail or whatever. And I, I can come to you just in the few minutes that I've sat and talked to you, I could tell it'd be like, oh, wow, I can trust Heather. Heather understands what I need to do. And then with your background, you're sitting there going, oh, you only need 800 square feet. And this is how the performer works to support that and blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then you, you, but you putting all these instruments in place, you know, you got the capital from your uncle with the partner. You, like you said, you've got all these things. You're taking the stress and the kind of this um, uh, anxiety away from those potential uh, customers. Um, now, so that was my, my do good by you because I, I just, I love this story. Now help, help paint a picture for the audience that's w listening and watching. What was, the, when you, when you did the warehouse 250, what was the end goal in mind? Um, I, I think initially I was very interested in, in saving old buildings downtown. Okay. It's something that I had wanted to do for a while. When I started looking, it was the only area that I told my realtor to look in. Oh. It was south of the arenas. I wanted an old warehouse. I wanted land. I wanted something that had an option to be adaptively reused in a different way. Um, and this is what we came upon. And uh, it kind of checked all the boxes. So I didn't know when I went in and bought it, how I would monetize it. I it's just knew just that dream. it needed yeah. to be. Okay. So I very early on met some people in um, the events world and I got some very good guidance. Um, first of all, um, not in the event world, but um, I got to know um, the man who actually saved the building originally. No way. So I don't know if you know who he is. Well, can you share on air or not? <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, his Michael Levine is someone that if anyone that oh, doesn't yes. know the downtown area, you know, he has single-handedly saved many, many buildings down there. And he was doing it very young. I mean, I, I didn't even know what shoes to wear in my 20s, and Michael is saving old buildings. So he did. He saved the Warehouse 215 from destruction. Um, he did an amazing remodel. He, he kind of uh, made sure that it could go forward, and then the people I bought it from had purchased it from him. And he has other uh, buildings downtown, his business is called Levine Machine. So yeah, I have a great respect for him. And I basically wanted to just finish what he started. Um, and it was mostly a matter of culling back all of the bad decisions that had been made in the building. Oh. So um, things that just don't make sense if you want to really, really let the, I call it the building is singing again. Yeah. So it really needs to be able to express itself. So as an example, um, we removed all of the drywall. We removed all of the storage out of the building. We took out walk-in coolers and storage and offices and like chairs and all the things that were inappropriate to have in a venue where that yeah. square footage can be monetized in so much better a way. Um, so after doing that, we took away rooms that were not necessary. We exposed as much of the building as we could. We cleaned up over 100 years of wires. Anyone that's in construction knows no one takes a wire down. They just add on. Yeah. So we had a massive pile of wiring, just cleaned the building up. Did you guys have environmental stuff? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we yeah. had a phase one and a phase two, and everything okay. was fine. Yeah. So oh, we so were, you, you, the, oh, so Michael had done the cleanup before? Uh, actually, the people that he b B bought it from did some. Um, and there, there so was nothing else to be with done. Like the no, the 
Traditional yes. asbestos and blah, 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 blah. Yes. Now, of course, anytime we do construction, yeah. um, if it's commercial, that's requirement that yeah. we test all of that. And everything came back fine, surprisingly. Oh, good. And uh, any envi environmental issues that came up had already been um, uh, remedied when we did our assessments, phase one and phase two. So for the audience's sake that aren't familiar with it, then uh, can you paint a picture now, Heather? Uh, how much of it is it 100% occupied right now or where, like, where are you at with things? Okay, so um, we started out where there were kind of different sections of the building. Mm -hmm. I opened up the building. Um, I took two rooms that I call the cathedrals. Okay. Um, they are the original footprint of the building mm -hmm. and I combined them into one large room. That one large room mm -hmm. can now seat, depending on the size of a stage, 600, 650 people with line of sight. It's almost nice. 12,000 square feet. It's bow truss ceilings, oh. clear story windows, all exposed brick. Um, it's, it's a beautiful building. So, so are you working with events people or are you going to handle that yourself? No, no, I don't know anything about okay. events. I hired an entire team. Um, <laughs> we are about the buildings, not the businesses within okay, the buildings. Well, I, I will do, so, do, I, yeah, I want to ask. Yeah, I think no, the, absolutely. The audience, uh, you know, because they're like, oh, wow, I can go to Heather for all this stuff. <laughs> well, I, I think that... Uh, you know, I have such limited bandwidth as it is. Yeah. I want to do the things that I have, you know, that I'm great at and the things that I that I can't delegate. Yeah. So uh, there's an entire event team that runs the entire business. So I hired some great people and they've filled in the gaps where we needed it. And um, we have a liquor license. We have now 28,000 square feet, about 21 of it, 21,000 square feet is rentable. Um, subsequent to the remodel that I did, our occupancy went from a 1,300 and something inside to 2,555. Nice job. Over 1,000 square feet more in less than two months. So how was so the... We had to go through historic. We had to get a certificate yeah. of no impact. Um, there's an easement, uh, but this is hoops. If, we, if you've done historic, you learn all the hoops yeah. to go through. The typical entitlements, yeah. as you want to call yep. that. So we now, also... How, how, did, how did Phoenix treat you through all this? Um, I mean, it's kind of a vague well, I, question. Okay. <laughs> there is one how Phoenician. Was the, yeah. <laughs> All right. How, through your eyes, I mean, this, this is, I'm not casting stones at the city of Phoenix, of I, but I'm just saying, what, were you happy? Did, did it go systematically? Yeah, it was absolutely fine. I okay. think that uh, I am happy to partner with cities that we do jobs in there. I am absolutely unafraid of inspectors. I want their eyes and ears yeah. on things. I think that they do add a lot. Um, but we had no issues whatsoever okay. with our with our uh, remodel. And uh, so let's see, we, we launched um, September 22nd. And between September 22nd and December 31st, um, the event team had 40 events. Nice. Yeah. Good so job. we have adaptively reused it pretty well. Um, I just recently enclosed a patio that was separating two other patios on the west side of the building. And I added a liquor license footprint. So we now have... Uh, 9,500 square feet of patio space with a liquor license. Beautiful. So, now, and is your cigar business in there as well? No. Well, it, my cigar business is kind of round hole square peg. Um, we are not a traditional brick and mortar lounge that I had no interest in doing that whatsoever. What I want to do is, um, as a raconteur, yeah. show people the different stories that can be told in Phoenix. Uh -huh. People don't realize that there are beautiful places to smoke in Phoenix if you are a cigar smoker. Nice. And it doesn't have to be a lounge. There's so many different options. I mean, we, we had our inaugural party certainly at Warehouse 215, and we highlighted a beautiful boutique brand um, called Adventura. Um, we were lucky enough that the uh, owners came in from Zurich, and their master blender came in uh, from the DR, and we had a beautiful dinner, you know, three cigars, three drinks, three courses, speak to the actual people who made these cigars, whys and whats and hows, and talk about tasting notes. And we really want to elevate experiences. So now uh, our next event is going to be at the Deuce. So we have Raconteuse at the Deuce, and that's May 7th. Everyone is welcome to come. We are doing a jazz brunch. So Sunday from 1 to 4, live jazz music um, from our partner, Magnificent Events, and uh, amazing food and drinks from the Deuce and uh, Raccoon 2 Cigars. And we're actually, uh, um, with every box purchase, you get entered into a raffle to win a uh, hot air balloon ride for two. So uh, we're, we're, we're happy to be out in the community. I think our next event we're finalizing now um, with the fabulous Jonathan Bento, 
with uh, the Pemberton. Yeah. So we're really excited to be there. And uh, we actually share a floor with Jonathan. We're in a, oh. an incubator now. So we're really excited about that, too. There comes a time when dreams become a reality, when you see your vision materialize into a true work of art. And the only way to get there is to choose a general contractor who shares that same vision and knows how to bring it to life. At Blue Wave, we aren't so big that we've forgotten where we've come from, and we aren't so small that we can't care for your projects regardless of their size. When your vision deserves safety, perfection, timeliness, and expertise in order to become a reality, trust Blue Wave to get it done right the first time. So talk about, and thank you for all that, Heather. Um, and I, I'm kind of guilty of this. I don't get, I don't, I don't get downtown as much as I, mm -hmm. I, I need to. But to help, help the audience understand all, all the, the movement, the, um, I call it kind of the touchy feely stuff that's going on in downtown. Other than just the quintessential bricks and mortar development, you know, Roosevelt Row and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. It, it's obvious that you're embedded into this culture down there. Sure. And I think it'd be great if you could just sh take, take some time and share, like you, you mentioned, Levine. Um, are you finding that everyone's kind of collaborating together and you guys are all kind of moving it as a whole? Or are there, are there certain, and I don't want to, again, I'm not trying to make this sound negative, mm -hmm. are there certain like clicks and niches that people are breaking off and doing like, like what you guys are doing, kind of that connecting piece is one piece. And then there's over here, it's the traditional high rise, you know, mm -hmm. multifamily mm -hmm. that's going on. And then over here, it's maybe um, like, I'm thinking back to when the Super Bowl took place, like what was going on down around the arena and things yeah. like that. I mean, there's so much, that's a big question. Yeah. So, I mean, I think first and foremost, I think it's very important as a developer, when you come into a community to not be tone deaf about the community. There you go. Um, my... Um, conversations with my neighbors, and I tell people, we are not the big commercial building in your neighborhood. I'm Heather. I'm your neighbor. Nice to meet you. Here's, here's my phone number. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I go to the meetings for the community, and I'm part of it just like any other owner is, and where I can, I talk a lot about using your powers for good. So where I can use my powers for good, I'm going to do so. I mean, we've some of the things that are really important to me is not just the monetizing, and we can get into how that happens and how you evolve in terms of um, uh, partnerships and uh, interactions with other people in the industry. But um, I really think that these private buildings that are down here that are so beautiful should be opened up to the public to be of service. So one of the first things I did when we moved in was I called Maricopa County Health Services, and I offered the building to give vaccines. So at this point, we've vaccinated over 5,000 Phoenicians in that building against COVID, against monkeypox, and Maricopa County Health Services has been amazing. So just one example of the kinds of things that, that should be done in these buildings. We also have an art grant with the neighborhood now. We're going to do a welcome mural on one of the buildings, and uh, you know we're going to invite all of the neighbors to come and be part of it. And we want people to know that we are welcoming. We're kind of at the beginning of the Central Park neighborhood. It starts on yeah. grant. So anything we can do to be of service or assistance, I think it's very important when you're developing to understand what the needs are of the community and maybe the art history and where who came before you. I mean, I, I know that initially um, the building I bought was a laundromat, right? So it was uh, um, laundry linens to, to a business to business. Mm. So it started out as Bell Laundry and then it evolved um, and... Uh, became Phoenix Linen and Towel, and they did that for many years. Um, and I feel like I feel the energy of the women that came before me that worked for so many years in that building. And those clear story windows are beautiful, but all that was was to let the heat out of the building. So amazing. I do not believe that it was a fabulous um, environment to oh, be in when you working. a horrible work environment. Yes, yeah. I think it was really – I can see that. And it was nice, one of the other first things that we, we – were able to offer and be of service is that one of the neighbors in the neighborhood called us and they're a, a neighborhood family and their matriarch had passed away. Um, and she grew up working in our building. So of course we let the family come and have their 
um, celebration of life for her, and we got to hear some really great stories. So it was really nice to have a full circle for them. So those are things that are really important to me. Um, I think that also bringing art and culture into a space. I really want the the art of that area to be spoken in the buildings that we put up. Um, the other kinds of things that it's a food desert. So we have two lots that um, now have been combined. Uh, it's about 15,000 square feet. Um, I am focused on getting a grocery down there. They oh, need nice. a bodega. They need a general store. Where are people getting their pharmacy? You know, where are you getting your medications? Where are you getting your haircut? Um, what services do you need as a neighborhood that we can help to enhance what's going on in the neighborhood? Because development is coming. It's not even coming. It's there. I mean, we sat in on an amazing uh, presentation that Chris Mackey gave, um, the head of economic development, and it was over 30 new projects in just the downtown Phoenix area. 30? That are over 30. Wow. I'm being <laughs> yeah over yes. thirty okay and they're they're you know they range from you know seventeen or seventy maybe uh, to eight hundred doors so there is a massive kind of shift going on and people are coming it's not if it's now oh, yeah so the battery now has has you know is done um, there there's so many other great projects that are already done Adeline is done. Um, and these are lots of doors. Lincoln Union is about to get started, right? Yep. And that's uh, office, right? Retail, um, parking, I, I think 300 and something doors for residential. I think you're right. So I, I think what, what needs to happen is that it's of utmost important to get developers that are ethical, that actually care, that actually want to be of service. Um, because then at least you have an opportunity to do good. Um, and that, if there's anything I can do to be help in that, I absolutely will. So, again, with your genuineness and authenticity, with the way you are and what you've already done, are you are you being sought after for for people to kind of come? Go, well, hell. well, you know what I mean. I'm, no, not, again, I, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, Heather. I'm just saying, hey, you know, look at. I mean, how I found you. I was like, this is a good story. Yeah, right? I mean, we've been really lucky. Um, we, um, I've had two write-ups in the Phoenix Business Journal. We've had two different uh, um, interviews with KTAR. Um, we had Fox 10 News come and nice. do a live feed and did a tour of the building. Um, we've, so yes, absolutely, people are knocking on our door, and so I, as you, it should be. You're right. It, okay, so, because I loved what you were saying earlier. So, like you said, I only have so much bandwidth, mm -hmm. I only have this, and I'm still, you mm -hmm. know, I'm still a for-profit over here, and mm -hmm. yes, I can do some other things. But with that, um, are, do you have any desire? Are you being asked to go outside Phoenix to look at other downtowns? Have you have, have, have um, I mean, with with all your worldly kind of experience? I think that I, th I think that for me, I, I spent a lot of years before I had kids working out of town. I did a lot of work in other states and driving and flying, and um, I am not entrenched enough in downtown to want to try a different downtown. Got it. I want there's so much more to do here that I'd rather put my energies into what we can do to make Phoenix a, an amazing downtown area. How can we be of better service to the to the occupants and to the businesses and, you know, to the visitors? I mean, you know, we talk about what happened with the Super Bowl. I mean, that whole area was just transformed the entire city. Yeah. Um, we, were, we were lucky enough. We were chosen as one of the uh, Business Connect members. So that's a small group of uh, minority-owned businesses that the um, uh, NFL Planning Committee kind of uh, chooses out of, they had over 2,000 applicants, and I think they had 220 businesses that they chose to kind of put them in front of opportunities to get contracts. Oh. And now I, I was not in need of the assistance that they offered, but I was so impressed by what they did. They really taught people that didn't know what it's like to have an online presence, what it's like to have to give out an RFP. How do you get in front of people? What do you say? How, what does your website look like? So they really were endeavoring to be of service to people that needed some of that. And um, it was a great organization. And our, their culmination cocktail party, we were able to host at Warehouse 215. And oh. that was the first time ever that they had had a partner also be able to be the venue. So that was really, really cool to be able to be part of that. We All 220 businesses were, were welcomed into the, the building and it was a, a great culmination event. We ended up not, our contract didn't come from that, but I can't say enough amazing things about that Super Bowl planning committee. BJ Waymer was 
um, phenomenal. Jay Perry is amazing. They have really, really strong, powerful women that know what the heck they're doing. So that did was you really see great. any um, um, Heather? Did you see any residual effects come out of that? Like, and what I guess what I'm kind of saying is like, were there any organic like spinoffs of going? Hey, granted, we had the horsepower of the Super Bowl here, but now when they leave. Let's us get together and do the same thing. Well, you know, it's funny that, uh, I mean, we had a six-day buyout um, from uh, the NFLPA. We, wow. we had three different parties. Um, it, we It was a great experience for everyone. Right. Um, I, I think that, yes, it's great, those ideas of collaboration. I think that I now have a list of other small businesses that I can call upon, you know, when the need arises to to offer, you know, their services to other people that might need some but uh i think it's 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 such a large thing to do that you have to just start off um i was uh honored to be um one of the 18 women um for dress for success this year that were women of impact so um they had an amazing uh event honoring these women and i talked to um ceo uh, tamala afterwards and i said well now you've put these 18 badass random women together. <laughs> what are we doing? You start a gang. <laughs> yes, I mean, what? but seriously, what kind of agendas can we put yeah. forth? What What can we get accomplished as this group of women? So I, I understand and I agree with that um, idea. It's just uh, bringing it to fruition and who's going to have the bandwidth yeah, to yeah. do it. Yes, yeah. yes. So what about, um, oh boy, my, my, my mind's kind of outpacing my ability to mm -hmm. ask you questions. So... You have a very unique lens to look at this through, mm. both, you know, both you know interpersonally and now with what's happened over mm -hmm. the last year or so. In the utopian world, what would what would you like to see, or what do you what do you what do you envision seeing over the next year downtown in kind of in that realm? As far as I guess I'm trying to narrow this down so it doesn't leave it so open ended. I guess like you're this developer and kind of cool developer now. What would you like to tackle next? Mm. I guess that's a sure. better question. I mean, there are very few historic buildings left. So okay. however I can um, offer what I do um, in, in service of saving these buildings and also ridding the area of blight and also adding jobs, the trickle down of what happens when you do this is, is phenomenal. Right. Because you, you know, even walking through an event, you know, it's not just the event team that has a job. It's all of the people that are in that business working at that building are now able to do more of that. So it's from lighting and sound and, you know, it's AV stuff, it's housekeepers, it's bartenders, it's bar staff, it's the people who, you know, rent the, we rent our ice machines from. I mean, all of True. that is such a revenue generating opportunity. Um, I, I think that um, if I can continue to do that and save old buildings at the same time, I think it's a it's a very fulfilling thing for me. What is the, you talked about, um, and again, forgive me. So we talked, you know, we have the retail component. Mm -hmm. We kind of talked to the food and beverage component. Mm -hmm. I'm going to spin that like with, with your own space, with your ability to host events. Mm -hmm. Let's call it more of the entertainment or entertainment or whatever you want to coin it well, as. Well, it's interesting because they're, they are talking about the kind of entertainment area of downtown Phoenix as moving further south. Um, that building is on the very end. It was annexed into the downtown warehouse community. Oh. So it's really the southern uh, tip of the warehouse community. And I think that... I think definitely that what we are coming together to do more things in terms of development. Um, we uh, were asked um, to join in a um, development incubator. So mm. we now have our first headquarters, and we are on Roosevelt Row, and we are in. Um, we're sharing a floor with four other small infield amazing developers in Phoenix, and an awesome architect and an awesome real estate agent. And we're going to see what happens. Nice. So I think I think that there's so that yeah you're answering my question exactly very so well absolutely that is okay. what's going to happen. But we all bring something different to the yeah. table, and we all have our own projects. I absolutely have multiple projects that I'm working on that that it's not time for me to tell anyone what yeah, they are now. I understand? But uh, yes, save more old buildings. Um, have you run up into any? Um, you know, I think I think we'd be remiss if we didn't ask this question. Are you running into any, you know, corporate giants or gargantuans that are, you know, like, hey, Heather, go away. You're a pain in my ass. Um, I had one conversation with someone um, and they were 
they didn't like the idea that I came up with about a grocery store um, coming down there. They didn't think that it... But that's uh, been an issue down the, there forever. I know that, but everyone's <laughs> entitled to their opinions. True. And True. I respect this person's very much, And uh, but I'm shockingly still doing it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I try to take from things what I can and, and um, try to find, like I said, what the best use of a space is. So there's just so much opportunity there. I'm really happy to be a part of it. I'm happy to um, have such a beautiful building, you know, as, as part of my portfolio of what I've been able to do. It's very rewarding to be able to do it for ourselves now. And of course, we still have our, our fabulous general contracting clients that we still really enjoy working with. Um, take a tangent. Let's go back to the cigar thing because mm -hmm. I'm just speculating, but a lot of people that are listening or watching this going, oh, how cool is Heather doing that? She's living out her dream. She's doing something mm -hmm. that she wants. And let's be honest, a lot of people are doing what they're, they kind of pigeonholed into what, yes, you know, like, like us. Yes. We're in construction, but you, you're living the dream. You did, you, you got the cigar business. That's, that's cool. How can you speak to that, to the audience going, you know, like follow your dream or what, one of those kind of things? <laughs> well, I mean, I really believe that you, you just get one shot. You know, we're only going through this once and I don't ever want to. <laughs> you mean you're not reincarnated? Exactly. <laughs> as far as I know, but I don't want to look back. I, I only regret the things I didn't do. Because, Versus what you did. Yeah. Because if something doesn't work, then I learn a lesson and I learn what I do want. I learn what I don't want. And when something does work, you know, you, you get to reap the benefits of that as well. So I think that I, I just go through things unafraid. So I'm willing to put myself out there. I mean, for some reason, my businesses are all male dominated. Um, that can be somewhat daunting for people. But in my situation, um, being a woman, being Jewish has never been an impedance to my being successful. You've obviously, yeah, doubled. but that's how it's supposed yeah. to be. Yeah, you know, so it, but it's not the case. There's there is inequity. So you know, we need my my um, Imagine Develops logo for my um, development business has a unicorn on it for a reason because. Why don't I know other women that do what I do? So I want to be something that is visible, that other people can see. Yes, I can do that. I have a 16-year-old. She needs to know she can be whatever she wants to be when she grows up. So we need to, if not us, then who? Right? This, this, so I do. So the cigar business, um, uh, like I said, I started it. What we are, we're an events-based business. It's mm. called Rack on Two Cigars. Um, it's very high end. It's a really beautiful experience. Um, we say that you know we go where the smoke takes us. So we're really, <laughs> really looking forward to kind of uh, we're going to come up with a passport now that people are going to get to utilize when they come to our different events, um, and you'll get special swag if you get to all of them. Um, but we do want to partner with lots of other people in town. To smoking is not for everyone, right. certainly, and, and uh, understandable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no issues if you don't care for it. Um, but you know, we're grown adults, and we do. We're allowed to make these decisions. Thank Plenty you. of people drink liquor all day long. Right. That's not great for you either. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that I love how bringing together the community happens in in a space with cigar smokers. Even people, maybe about thirty, at least thirty percent of our of our uh, participants, of our guests that buy tickets and come to our events, do not smoke cigars. Doesn't surprise me. Yeah, because yeah. We're, we're we're providing an experience. The yeah. jazz is wonderful. The patio is beautiful. The music and the food and the drinks are great. And oftentimes, if you're not a cigar smoker and you're in a space where people are smoking cigars, it, it it's very evocative of prior experiences. I hear so many people say, oh my gosh, I love my grandfather. That reminds yeah. me of him. You know, one woman told me my grandma is, you know, uh, smoked cigars her whole life. Like people have great um, memories of it um, by smelling, you know, cigar smoke. So I think that... Speaking of that nostalgia and educate uh, novice like me, is pipe smoking coming back or is that part of it? You know, I don't, I don't have a great knowledge base about pipes. It is different. I don't okay. have a lot of knowledge okay. about it to answer I was answer just curious if, yeah. if you could ask that question. No. Or if, okay. I mean, I certainly have. There There are cigar smoking groups that I have met, and they're a, kind of a niche up into themselves, if that makes right. sense. Um, but they're all very nice people. So, yeah. Um, I have, uh, now I'm going back to 
your other business, you know, actually mm. being a general contractor. Yes. So with your notoriety this last year, maybe it's even longer, but at least as I've been exposed to your notoriety, have you found you've been asked to do, is there anything awkward that you've been asked to get, get into that normally wouldn't be in your lane? Um, mm. Well, we were, um, I didn't realize, I guess it's still in my lane, but we were actually nominated for as a finalist um, for the Red Awards. Oh, for that's the great! Redevelopment. Yeah, I had no idea what that was. Oh yeah, that's and a big deal. I know. I, I, my designer Susan, who's just so amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I brought her with me, and we went in, and I was like, "There's like 600 people in this room," and then when they won, they brought like 15 people up, and they were in their fancy clothes, and I was like, "What?" So it like. It truly was an honor to be a top five finalist yeah. for redevelopment because that was the first building I redeveloped for myself. Not, so I thought, like, I mean, outside my lane a bit, yes. Um, the things that I don't, I don't, I pick and choose very carefully who I will work with. Thank you. So people think that when you have uh, an interview with a general contractor that you're, they're interviewing you. Well, sweetheart, it goes both ways. So um, I also have... Uh, I don't know if I can curse on this, but yeah. I have an asshole out clause in all my contracts. I love it. Because I don't want you to be disrespecting my staff. Yeah. I, sometimes people have unrealistic expectations. Um, I'm not interested in your brother's uncle who does cabinetry that you want to come in and do this. Um, <laughs> no, no. I, see, and that's very befitting of what this podcast was always, you know, let's mm -hmm. talk about those tougher issues that we all face. And mm -hmm. I love, Heather, that you're bringing that up. Because if we had... You know, 2,000 GCs are oh, on this gosh. table. We'd all have that. Right? Isn't that terrible? Yeah. It's great and horrible in the same way, but we all have the same terrible stories. Yeah. And my my designer and I are writing a book, actually. I love and it. It's, it. But it's sad because <laughs> what happens is that I think that the, the knowledge base of the end use consumer is so limited as compared to the general contractor. I've been general contracting small, boutique, expensive, historic spaces for 25 years. I've been there, done that already. So my knowledge base is so vast as compared to someone who's opening a boutique yeah. that what happens in this industry is that people get taken advantage of a lot. And uh, every, it, when that happens, people get a chip on their shoulder. So they see red flags where there aren't any. They don't really understand the nature of what they're talking about. So we're very careful to vet people. Um, I don't think that, that – I don't appreciate that this industry is um, one that people think people take advantage of you. But I see it happening. And I – yes, we are going to get paid adequately for what we do. But you do not have to take advantage of people in the process. So – for me, I want to be a good steward with my client's mo money and with my client's time. So I'm going to guide that process. And that's part of what you're paying for, True. is for that stewardship of my knowledge having been through this all the time. And those that can trust me to do my job and stay out of the way are the ones that have successful outcomes. So we've, we've had in the last couple of years two big projects that we fired because I would, I, not every dollar is a dollar I want to make. I was no longer interested in working with them. So well stated. Yeah, it's just not. It, it's I, we want to be passionate and love the things that we do, and we're we're able now to pick and choose. So we do. There comes a time when dreams become a reality, when you see your vision materialize into a true work of art, and the only way to get there is to choose a general contractor who shares that same vision and knows how to bring it to life. At Blue Wave. We aren't so big that we've forgotten where we've come from. And we aren't so small that we can't care for your projects regardless of their size. When your vision deserves safety, perfection, timeliness, and expertise in order to become a reality, trust Blue Wave to get it done right the first time. So I know you said earlier that you you know again for proprietary reasons and secret you can't talk about some of the other things that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. But I assume is it safe to say and for the audience's sake that you're going to continue to be a staple and that steward of the downtown. Uh, oh yes, yeah, and they're and, not getting rid of me. Good. So our good. our uh, our uh, 
incubator is full of people like me. Good. And uh, we definitely are passionate about what we're doing. Um, we are very focused in the downtown area. We're very focused south of the arenas. Um, we want to go in the spaces that people are not interested in going in. Well, I mean, I'm thrilled to go into them. I'm okay with that. So I look forward to the next deals that we're doing in the downtown area. And um, we're aligning ourselves with some pretty great folks. We're going to make sure that, that we include beautiful art in our spaces and that we meet the needs of the, the neighborhood around us. Um, I have a question, and again, this is me to ask you, maybe it's a too naive a question, mm. but as you're getting just outside the downtown, mm -hmm. you know, the old residential areas, mm -hmm. are you, you and, and this, this kind of consortium of, of people like, like you that are trying to do this for all the right reasons, these stewards are, are you finding or being asked to convert or, or again, repurpose some of those residential areas into kind of these quasi commercial areas? Like I'm thinking of if you and forgive me if I screw up this name, mm. but if you're west of the downtown, there's that I know there's like that one pizza place that's basically in like an old house, and you know those kind of things in that downtown area. And I'm just curious, Heather, is that is that a thing, or am I just making well, this up? I, no, I think that there are opportunities to evolve residential spaces, but I think you have to be very sensitive to that because um, this is at least the community that that I am thinking of that is south of the arenas is a very hardworking, proud community. These are people that get up every day yep. and go to work. Um, and they have- They don't want a party spot till- No, yeah. and they they enjoy having home, home ownership for many people. That is the way in which they create wealth generationally mm -hmm. is by having home ownership. So I don't want to be somebody one that's going to walk in and say, I'm going to bulldoze these four houses um, and, and give you a QT. Um, I want to be conscious about what's done. No, and, and thank you. And that wasn't what I was referring to. I was thinking of just, how do I say Well, it? look, I mean, if you think of like um, the, the phenomenal success that True North has had, you know, there you shout go. out to JV. Yeah, there um, you go. But Jonathan Bartow has an amazing skill at taking spaces and creating out of them. That's so, exactly yes. what I was getting so, at. I mean, yeah. if you think about the Pemberton and what he's done there, that right there is a beautiful yeah. conglomeration of interesting, small, quirky spaces that he has uh, created a really welcoming environment for people to come and enjoy it. So things like that, I think, should be done. Um, and I think that they benefit the community as a whole. You brought up another one, Heather, that interests me, and I, I think the audience would, would, to get your opinion and kind of take on this, is you talked about grant dollars. Mm. Where, where do you see that, is Phoenix woefully behind in whether it was state or federal, are there are there are there a lot of grant opportunities out there for things like this? I mean, I'm going to say that yes, but I think that it's something that even I need more research to do. There's a lot of opportunities that the city and the state and the Fed want to provide you because what we're doing is we're ridding areas of blight. Yes, you are. We are benefiting the community as a whole by bringing services in. We're not afraid to do the small, intricate things. That's kind of where right. our, our power lies in those small details. Um, so yes, but I think that, like I said, I even have to get more knowledgeable about all those hoops to jump through. Well, maybe so that, that's our public announcement then. Maybe I know, we'll get some right? more, exactly. some more grant, we, grant specialists to I help I know, we help do have some out. names and numbers of folks, okay. um, but I, I think there's, you know, tax benefits. Right. There's all kinds of of ways that, and I and I, I think that some of that comes from our leadership. I mean, there there is not a single sentence that you can say with the name Kate Gallego in it that does not include helping the community in some way. I mean, she um, single-handedly has done some amazing things, and I think that it, it makes us uh, excited as developers to be able to come in and, and know that we have support and also know that we want to do the work to know how to best um, have the community be served. Like as an example, getting a small grocer, a bodega, a general store there, a small pharmacy there. You know, it's not just enough to do that. You also need to make sure that these people have discounts on f their fruits and their vegetables, right? I think that you can do things like that, offering discounting based on your zip code, based on, you know, a series of things that people smarter than I will come up with. But... Uh, being of service to the neighborhood, I think, is of utmost importance when you're doing things like that. Well stated and well captured. Heather, what um, 
What have I failed to ask you? I mean, what, oh, what am I missing off the obvious questions that I should be asking you? I don't know. I'll tell you a fun story if you want. Please. So um, I now, I guess, own six businesses because I don't have enough time. Underachiever. I know, right? <laughs> um, one of them um, I uh, make furniture with. So we'll manufacture furniture from some of our, for some of our projects. Um, I, I bought some amazing old flooring um, a few years ago, and I just kept it in storage and decided once I started the cigar business to go ahead and make some tables to use out of this flooring. Well, it's the former America West Arena flooring. Oh. So we had an opportunity. Um, I've been a Suns fan and season ticket holder for years, and so I know quite a few people there, and we had them in the building. Uh, the event team hosted a... Uh, uh, women in sports and events. So we took one of our friends around and that works with the sons and we ended up talking. They came back and we hosted their um, party to uh, honor the 30th anniversary of their road to the finals against the Bulls. What yeah. a great season that was. How amazing is that? It just so happens that my tables are made on the floor that they played that series on because they're date stamped. How cool so is that? I, I asked if they would be willing, and we had all the legacy and the new players sign the tables. Yeah. So I have these beautiful tables, two of which say America West. My are you going to keep them, sell them? What are you going to oh, do? Oh, gosh, no, we're keeping them. Okay. Well, so, I, <laughs> hey, you, you, a lot of people are probably like, i got to get a hold of Heather. I want to buy one of those. I mean, we do, have, we do have enough to make probably another maybe 15 tables perhaps, oh. um, but um, I, I'm using five of them in my office. I actually have... My, my beautiful desk says the word arena on it oh. and has uh, Devin Booker's signature and, and, uh, and Ish Wainwright's signature. So, yeah, we want, I don't, it's like uh, the whole theory of life is short, right? Yeah. Smoke the cigar, eat the cake, use the good silver. It's, I don't want to hide these things away. No. We put lacquer on it so the signatures aren't going anywhere. And if you're interested in seeing them, come to a Raconteuse event because we use them. So uh, we're, we're really happy to have, again, that's another example of adaptive reuse. Agreed. That was sitting for 30 years doing nothing outside, and now it's made into beautiful tables that help support a business, that help, you know, everyone knows cigar smokers want a place to sit. <laughs> so, you know, having that kind of furniture to meet the needs of that, that particular market is, is great. So I, I think that just in all things we do, we should be kind of, Paying attention to how we can utilize the things that are that are here for us. All right. So, in your line of work, you had to have been asked this question before. Is there anything cool you found in the walls, Heather, mm -hmm. <laughs> or in the dirt, oh gosh, or in the yes. attic? Come oh, on, dude, tell, tell I us can't some even. Come on, you got to give right. us some good ones. All right, let's see. Um, well, I preferably had, not any dead bodies. I but. know no <laughs> dead bodies, but um, I had the honor of uh, saving the former Merriman's funeral home. And that is uh, my client owns the bu the building, right. and uh, we worked on it. I was actually in Europe. Got a call from him. Um, we got together. I it took a few years to actually get through all of the hoops, but um, it's now uh, it's just south of Matt's Big Breakfast on oh, yeah. like First and Roosevelt, and it's now opened. And uh, um, the tenant is uh, Chucky Duff, who's amazing, and uh, the the business is called Sin Muerte, which is no death. In the former funeral home, that's all gothic. He's a genius. Yes. Um, but it was really cool. We found. Um, let's see. When we were doing um, the area where we put the bathrooms in, we found a sinkhole. So we went through the very very thick slab, and it was like a massive. It was a massive room. It was like you can stand up in it. So it, it looked like perhaps the old um, sewer. Oh, the had, old cistern or something? Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. It had like a leak, so it I slowly... I thought you were going to tell me it was like an old speakeasy. No, and that, that, that's <laughs> like, about... <laughs> hey, for those of you that are here for the yeah, funeral, exactly. go down and take a bump. Seriously, no, uh, <laughs> you, uh, if we need speakeasies, we need to get Matt Fulton on yeah, this conversation. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Who happens to share a floor with me, by well, the way? Oh, there you go. He's a good dude. Um, but yeah, no, we just joked and said, you know, I'm sure that's where all the bodies are. <laughs> So we, and then you're half going, oh, yes. did we say the right thing? And we, of course, effectively and safely, you know, yeah. we, we filled it um, with, uh, gosh, I don't even remember what we filled it with, concrete uh, slurry. Yeah, just a slurry. So, yeah, mix. we slurried it full. But, yeah, we just had a great time. I've seen amazing things in walls. Um, what is super interesting is kind of if you understand construction and you open up a wall, you'll see like the layers of life that have happened. Mm. So especially with these older homes, older businesses, 
um, older buildings that have gone into disrepair, it's cool to open it because yeah. you literally, uh, the building will speak to you. It will tell you what it was um, if you just know how to listen. Great story, Heather. Um, listen, I just can't thank you enough for coming on today. I think, Absolutely. you know, um, you, you nailed all the things that I wanted to do to ex help expose you in the story for, for what this podcast was all about, mm -hmm. you know, instead of the traditional, Hey, we're going vertical and mm -hmm. we're talking about mm -hmm. expansion, all this, this is, it's kind of near and dear to my heart because just like you, I grew up in the upper Midwest. And so you know, the old Minneapolis and, and the old Milwaukee and mm -hmm. things like that just speak to me. So mm -hmm. when I see this and I've got friends that are well into, um, your kind of line of work mm -hmm. and, and they say the same things you do, you know, which is, it's a connection to people. It's a connection mm -hmm. to history. And it's a story moving forward, too. Sure. And also, when you reference going back to the Euro model, I mean, we could have spent about two hours on that alone going, why do people keep going to Europe? Well, or these these old mm -hmm. cities, it's like because they feel something different. Mm -hmm. It's not like driving through a strip sure. mall. It, like the way exactly. we like the way we develop, but that's why it's it's our responsibility. Yes. I mean, what is amazing is that I know what I did to that building. Right, it's not only going something that benefits people now. It's going to be there in a hundred years. Exactly. So I think that to be able to leave something like that that's indelible, that tells a story of what was here, um, is is a great legacy. Well, thank you again, and for anyone that wants to reach out to Heather, um, you know, you look her up on Warehouse Two Fifteen or the Rack and Two Cigars. Yeah, um, we're on uh, Rack on Two Cigars dot com. Our uh, uh, website is imaginedevelops.com. Imagine Develops, yep. okay. And uh, we're on Instagram as well. And She's everywhere. <laughs> we're happy to uh And she's to looking for about everyone. six more businesses, so if you need a good partner, <laughs> let her know. <laughs> she's in the capital raising uh, right now. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> Thank you, I Heather. appreciate you.